Good evening. My name is Paul Hutchcroft. I'm director of the School of International Political and Strategic Studies here in the ANU College of Asia and the Pacific. And I'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and paying our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. It's my great pleasure to welcome and to introduce U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State Edgar D. Kagan to the ANU, and also to welcome our uh, distinguished guests from the U.S. Embassy here in Canberra, as well as other distinguished guests from the diplomatic community. Since July, Mr. Kagan has held the post of Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs in the U.S. Department of State, in which capacity he focuses on U.S. relations with Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Islands. Mr. Kagan graduated from Yale University in 1989 and then worked with the New York City Bureau of Bridges for a couple of years before moving into a more figurative type of bridge building and bridge repairing, namely by joining the U.S. Foreign Service in 1991. His diplomatic bridge building career has taken, taken him from Cote d'Ivoire to Hungary to the policy planning staff in Washington to Israel, where he worked on Middle East, uh, the Middle East peace process as well as reported on Israeli domestic policies and human rights issues. Beginning in 2000, uh, perhaps before, but this is, this is what I understand, he started working on this part of the world, first with the State Department's China desk and later with the political section of the embassy in Beijing. His work in China included serving as the North Korea watcher and the external unit chief. But it's in 2007 that things really started to get exciting because that's when he moved to Canberra to take up a posting at the U.S. Embassy here. In his three-year um, stint in Canberra, he served as economic and then political e economic counselor. I met him at that point in this building, and it's a pleasure to have you back in town. Post-Canberra, Mr. Kagan took up the post of Director of Korean Affairs from 2000 to 2012, including serving as Acting Deputy Secretary, Secretary, Acting Assistant Secretary, uh, Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary, excuse me, for Japan and Korea. His focus today is on the dramatic changes in the Pacific region in recent years and the unique opportunities and challenges for the countries of the region. Please join me in welcoming Edgar Kagan, and we look forward to his public lecture this evening on U.S. engagement with the Pacific Islands and the region. Welcome. Thank you very much. It is a great pleasure to be back in Canberra and to be back at ANU. Um, and I really am humbled that so many people would think that this was worth attending and very appreciative. Um, I had a great time in Canberra, and one of the things that I really learned is how valuable the research and the people at ANU are to understanding what's happening in the region. Um, and I'm very, very grateful for the you know, sustained focus on the Asia Pacific, but particularly on the Pacific um, that is it takes place at this university. <clears throat> um, you know, I, what I would suggest is my goal is I'll try and have remarks, um, but what I really think is helpful is we can have some questions um, afterwards, and I can try and address as many concerns and issues that people might have. Uh, I think you know the first thing, and obviously the critical one, is the United States has been part of this region and has been engaged in the Asia Pacific for a very, very long time. And that we value our relationships in the region, we value the close partnerships that we have with many countries, um, and that we are very focused on expanding and enhancing our relations with the Asia Pacific as a whole. And with the, um, and as a part of that, recognizing that our engagement, to, to be really effective, our engagement with the Asia Pacific region has to include a focus on the Pacific as well as East Asia. Um, we believe that we've been part of the region, we've been a 
you know, very engaged. We, this goes back to you know, trade um, in you know, the first U.S. Uh, contacts with East Asia took place in the late 18th century, driven by trade. Um, we've been involved politically in the region for a very long time, and in many ways, you know, the sort of the, one of the seminal things in our modern engagement has been things that happened 70 years ago. And as we go through the 70th anniversaries of the Battle of the Coral Sea and of the U.S. landing on Guadalcanal, it's, as well as the Battle of Midway, it's been very humbling to realize that, you know, many in many ways, this is the, the beginning of the modern U.S. engagement in the region, um, as well as obviously the partnership and alliance with Australia. Uh, we see ourselves as having been engaged, bring you know having a, a history that is one that is built in partnership with the countries in the region. Um, we have very strong strategic interests in the region, but we also believe that we have a very strong moral um, as well as historical role that in engagement that we see as being very critical as we move forward. Um, one of the things that we have heard is that, you know, the U.S. engagement in the region is something that people believe that we had perhaps let go, um, that we had lost some of our focus on the Pacific, um, and that one of the messages that we heard very strongly it ha was that we needed to ramp this up that we needed to be more engaged, we needed to be more present, we needed to have you know, more dialogue, but also do more tangible activities. And so we've tried to heed that message and we've tried to step this up. Um, you know, the U.S. engagement in the region is interesting, it's somewhat complicated by the fact that we have a number of different strands that create a the, the mosaic that we have now, including our very unique relationships with the three compact states, which were formerly trust territories, um, which means that some of the traditional measures that we have of our engagement um, don't quite work because, for instance, you know, we have we, the U.S. spends about three hundred thirty million dollars a year on activities in the Pacific, but much of that doesn't fall in the traditional baskets of official development assistance because it's done with the compact states through a variety of U.S. government departments, which are engaged as part of the legacy that we have um, as well in the specific legal obligations we have under the compacts. We have sought to significantly expand our dialogue with Australia and with New Zealand on the Pacific. Uh, one of the things that we recognize is that you know we have a great deal of expertise, but it is very much in our interest to try and take advantage of the extraordinary expertise that Australia has, as well as New Zealand, and then obviously to work directly with the countries in the region. Um, and we very much value the relationships that we have and the expansion of the dialogue that's taken place in the last few years. Uh, we see our involvement in the region through a number of prisms, and I think it's very important to sort of recognize that, that this is, you know, what we're doing in the Pacific is part of a broader strategy, and that includes engaging with traditional allies and working on our traditional alliance relationships, which is obviously always very important in the United States, an important part of what we do. Uh, another is enhancing our relationships with emerging partners. And you know, if you look at our relationship with China, it is quite extraordinary, the breadth and depth of the relationship and how much we've expanded the range of issues that we talk about, the number of formal and informal dialogues that we have, the very close consultation that we have on a wide range of issues, the greater resilience that that has built into the relationship, which was obviously highlighted um, in May at the time of the Strategic and Economic Dialogue when we had another issue that emerged um, that we were able to manage in the without disrupting our other relationships and other exchanges. And we think that's a real testament to the investment that we've made and that China has made in to have a better relationship. But we've also sought, and this is perhaps one of the departures of the last few years, we've sought to increase and strengthen our engagement with regional institutions. And so you see us formalizing a relationship with ASEAN and Sending, a, we were one, the first non-ASEAN country to have an accredited resident ambassador. Um, we have also sought to increase our engagement with bodies like the um, Pacific Islands Forum, which we see as a very important regional institution that plays a role in the um, in the Pacific region. That we recognize that we should be doing more with, and so you can see that you know we uh, starting, and this actually you know, predates 
this administration, where there started to be more engagement um, in the, the immediate, immediately preceding this administration. This administration has really sought to enhance by um, having more regular exchanges at the leader level with the Pacific. Um, and I should, in that regard, I should note President Obama uh, met with Pacific Island leaders in Honolulu in November of last year. Secretary Clinton has met with Pacific leaders um, at the margins of the UN General Assembly uh, for several years. Uh, last year, 2011, our Deputy Secretary of State, Tom Nides, attended the Pacific Islands Forum. And then obviously this year, Secretary Clinton attended the, um, the post-forum dialogue and met with the leaders uh, in Rotonga, which was, for us, very significant. I mean, you know, we recognized that the, you know, the, the attendance of the U.S. Secretary of State sent, in our view, an important signal of our desire to engage with the region and to do it in a very substantive and meaningful way. And, you know, this was something that it was the first time it's ever happened and which we believe was a very successful engagement, which was, you know, we, we hope the region appreciated it, but we certainly appreciated what we learned and the value of our discussions. We've also tried to institutionalize greater engagement at the next level down. And so in the last two years, uh, the, our Assistant Secretary of State, Kurt Campbell, has traveled with the commander of the U.S. Navy's Pacific Fleet to do a Pacific tour. And this year, we went to seven countries um, and, you know, to try and have a sustained engagement with an interagency team on our side, both representing both the State Department, um, their military, uh, USAID, uh, to, as, and, and the White House, as part of trying to highlight that we really do want to have serious discussions, we want to learn, we want to make sure that we're coordinating and being as effective as we can. Um, we have tried to s sustain this by also looking for broader ways of, to cooperate. One of the things that we heard from the region was that you know, there was a great deal of frustration about the lack of a USAID presence, U.S. Agency for National Development. And so last year, we opened a U.S. Agency for National Development office in uh, Port Moresby that has a regional focus. Uh, we are trying to look at things that we do so we can enhance our effectiveness by coordinating with key donors, which is obviously Australia, New Zealand, but also the European Union, Japan, um, you know, multilateral development banks, um, other regional institutions. Uh, we also have tried very hard to look for areas where we can work cooperatively with China. Um, we, as Secretary Clinton said in Rarotonga, we welcome new partners for the region. This is a region that clearly can benefit from additional partners that are willing to provide valuable and important assistance. We think this has to be done in close coordination with the countries concerned so that the whatever new assistance that flows meets the needs and supports the development objectives of the countries involved. Uh, but we very much believe, as Secretary Clinton said, that the, you know, the Pacific is big enough for everybody and that there are real benefits that come to all of us if there are more partners for the region. Uh, we have recognized that one of the key things that we need to do in the region, that's very important for the region, is fisheries management and protection. And we have long been involved through the U.S. Um, uh, Pacific uh, Tuna Treaty uh, in trying to provide some regional flows of money that are linked to this, but also something that we believe is critical because it is very transparent mechanism that show for fisheries management where there's very clear benchmarks and that we believe has led to the U.S. tuna fleet being, you know, extremely proactive, extremely good at management and sustainability. And we think this is something that is very important for the region. We're in the process of negotiating um, a, a extension of this, and you know, we, we believe we've made some significant progress. We still have a ways to go. But we've really focused on the importance to the region of enhanced returns from, obviously, one of its critical assets. We've also focused on the importance of transparency and clarity and, and um, improved and enhanced management. And we believe that this is something that, if we can bring this to closure, will support U.S. interests in the region, but which we like to think is good for the region as well. Uh, I think one of the things that we try and do in this vein is we have a number of programs 
and that um, try and support fisheries management. We are so a member of um, some of the agencies and organizations that work on this. We also try very hard to take advantage of some of the things that we bring to the table that we believe you know, help reinforce our role and support the region. And one of them is the Shiprider program, which people may be familiar with. Uh, this is something where we sign shipwright agreements with countries that then allow them to, when we have uh, Coast Guard vessels transit or operate in the region, they can, uh, send a country with which we have a shipwright agreement, can have uh, representatives that go on board the vessel, which can then help to enforce their laws and their EEZs. So this is something that has been welcomed and we, which we're looking to try and expand and enhance because we do believe that while you know, it's not a panacea, it's not a silver bullet, it does support the broader objective of helping countries manage their, own, their uh, fisheries resources and at the same time help preserve and promote sustainable uh, fisheries management. Um, we have uh, tried to take advantage of our ability to sort of engage with a number of donors to try and enhance coordination. We strongly support the Australian government's uh, efforts through the CANS Compact to enhance donor effectiveness. We think this is really critical. We are working very hard to try and make sure that we are able to bring the right kinds of resources to bear. Um, in an atmosphere, it, it, you know, very constrained for us, but which we think ramping up assistance linked to addressing some of the impacts of climate change is very important. Uh, we also are seeking to, you know, support efforts by others and, and to enhance um, the status of women and empower women in the region. We believe this is clearly something the region can benefit from, and it supports both the goal of improving the status of women, but also sustainable development. Uh, we welcome the Australian government's initiative, to a very significant initiative in this regard. We also have tried to put some of our own resources in play and to highlight this issue in the engagements that we've had. Um, in particular, I should note that when Secretary Clinton went to uh, Port Moresby in 2010, this was something that she really focused on, and she did again um, in Rotonga. Uh, we, I think, also want to try and make sure that what we're doing is sustainable, that it empowers people at the community level, that we try and build the, the sort of the, the human capital that will help the region. And we recognize, obviously, there's huge challenges in that regard, but we are very proud of what we've managed to do in that regard. You know, I think the long-standing presence of the U.S. Peace Corps is something that we are very gratified by, the warm reception they received. The, the, I mean, that's one of the things that countries, almost every country in the region that we engage with wants Peace Corps if they don't have it or wants more Peace Corps if they do. <coughs> and we believe that the, you know, the vitality, the energy of these volunteers is really critical and plays a very valuable role. Um, I think that we want to try and make sure that what we do addresses the needs of a very diverse and disparate region. And all too often, you know, we and, and you know, uh, we in government and others, I think somehow, you know, sort of talk about the Pacific as if it's one cohesive region with common objectives and, you know, common challenges. And obviously there are really significant differences between, you know, Micronesia, uh, Polynesia, and Melanesia. There are very significant differences between countries. And we're trying very hard to be as sensitive to that as we can. Um, and to work with other partners on this so that we can try and target what we do so it's as effective as possible. But I think that, you know, if you take a step back, the, the key thing for us is that we recognize that to be effective in the Asia Pacific, we have to be effective in the Pacific. That this is an area where we have some strategic interests, we have historical interests, we have moral interests, um, and that we are very grateful for the cooperation and partnership that we have with Pacific countries. Um, we have obviously large Pacific populations in the United States um, and you know, are, we feel are extremely, extremely helpful. They're good for us and we'd like to think that the, it's good for the countries involved as well. Uh, we want to try and expand the relationships, expand the partnerships. We recognize that you know, we need to listen and learn from people who know more than us and we're very focused on trying to do that. We want to recognize we need to operate as partners and as friends, that we, you know, we, we are not in a position to say this is how it's supposed to be done because you know, the region faces very cha challenging circumstances. At the same time, we're very excited by a lot of things that are happening. And you know, one of the things, obviously, is in Papua New Guinea, 
the um, the LNG investment, which you know is a very very significant U.S. stake in the region. Uh, we believe that this is something that we has tremendous potential for Papua New Guinea. Um, and you know, at the same time, we want to work very closely with the PNG government in terms of how it will be, uh, how the effects and, and some of the challenges that come with resource windfalls will be managed. We also want to try and work closely with other countries as they face some of their own challenges, and, that, and at the same time, coordinate closely with our traditional allies and partners in Australia and New Zealand. Um, I, you know, this is sort of in a nutshell, and I'm sensitive I could obviously go on a, a greater length, but I think that the, the key things for us are the long-term importance of this, the strategic importance of this, and the desire to work with, with the region um, and work closely. So with that, I would throw it open to questions and happy to answer as much as whatever I can. investment and as a champion for freer and fair society. And I just want to really focus on that freer and, freer and fair society. And now, over 50 years, uh, West Papua people have been suffering. And they're suffering now. There are a lot of killings and torture and humiliations and, and neglect. Uh, uh, the, the, the world buys me about in West Papua. And uh, as a result, we are suffering uh, continuously. And the uh, US and Australia are uh, uh, funding the detachment IDI which involve a lot of killings of uh, innocent West Papuans uh, at the moment. And I'm just, um, would like to ask you a question. How do you see the um, West Papuan people will benefit from your fairer and um, sort of freer society engagement within the regions? Because the, as you are fully aware that the, one of the biggest uh, man-made object you can see on that western half of the island is that the hole in the middle of the island. Uh, of the of the land is the hole that that got by the uh, your company U.S. company Freeport, and it is a tragic uh, side effects of the to the local people at the moment. So, just can you please explain uh, what's your uh, sort of uh, role in the regions uh, and then how you see the West Papua people will benefit from this fairer and prosperous sort of a uh, fairer and freer sort of society that you sort of are trying to uh, uh, put forward in the Pacific region. Also, you mentioned you talk about the moral responsibility. Uh, you come in, in the name of moral responsibility. And, ha and how you see that uh, the West Papua issue is uh, morally acceptable uh, over the 50 years, over the last 50 years, and we have been uh, uh, suffering uh, in the hands of Indonesia militarily uh, brutal rule. So can you please just uh, explain briefly your position? In the, in, the, in the case of West Papua? Certainly. Um, you know, obviously what you raise is something that we take quite seriously and we you know, deep understand um, your concerns and your, you know, your frustration. I think that, you know, from our standpoint, we have, we're very pleased with the steps that have been taken by Indonesia and the, the strengthening of our relationship with Indonesia in, the, in recent years. We believe that one of the things that is very important is we've had a very good dialogue with Indonesia on a number of issues, including uh, the importance of human rights and development. You know, obviously, you know, there's a long history to this, and you know, this is something that is a challenge for the people in Papua as well as in Indonesia. Um, but we think that the way forward on this is the strengthening of democratic institutions in Indonesia, which we believe has happened. That the better development um, brings the benefits of development to the people throughout the country. And so we think this is something that, that there has been progress on. Now, obviously, you know, there, there's challenges 
Uh, and we believe that the way to address those is by continuing to work on this and make clear our values, make clear what we stand for, make clear that we are looking at this as, a, as one of the issues in the relationship. But at the same time, I think it's very clear from our standpoint, we are very satisfied. We believe there's been extraordinary progress in Indonesia. Um, we believe our relationship with the Indonesian government has grown much stronger and that we have seen real progress on a whole range of issues um, in with the things that we discuss with the Indonesia. So obviously, you know, this, there are things that we, want, that we take very seriously that we want to continue working on, but we do it in a context of great deal of satisfaction about where the relationship with Indonesia, Indonesia has gone. In terms of the broader engagement in the region, I think it's important, I mean, you know, human rights is something that is very critical to us. We have been champions of human rights around the world for many, many years. We've raised human rights with countries when you know, often others wouldn't. Um, we've tried to address this. This is an important part of our dialogue with countries around the world. I mean, I should note that you know, in addition to having the fact that we regularly have discussions with some countries in Asia, you know, we were expanding this. We recently had a very productive human rights dialogue with um, Burma, Myanmar. And so this is something that we take seriously and that we believe is an important moral obligation for us to undertake as part of our values as we engage with the world. So I think that you know in the Pacific, one of the things that we see is that there is a culture that is respectful of human rights. I mean, I think that you know, there are obviously exceptions, there are obviously challenges, but we do believe that this is something where we have such important shared values in the region. And so we will try and keep building on that and expanding that and making sure that that's the subject of our discussions with countries throughout the region and around the world. Thanks very much. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Kelly, just a couple of themes you had in your address were uh, cooperation with China, like US engagement with China and deepening and, and broadening, and also the need to uh, cooperatively uh, deliver aid, development, and assistance to whatever within the region. Um, it seems to me to be a, a reticence on part of China to to engage with other donors uh, to coordinate this. Uh, they prefer to do things unilaterally um, for whatever reason and also they obviously uh, support their own outcomes. Uh, is that a concern to the United States? Um, and what, if it is, what is the United States doing to, to address that? Certainly, I mean, we believe that donor coordination is vital around the world. I mean, I think it's very clear that in <coughs> most countries where there are multiple donors, how you coordinate assistance, how you coordinate activities is very important for a bunch of reasons. One of them is obviously you want to try and be as effective as possible. The other is that you know, on a very basic level, you want to make sure that people who should be involved with helping develop their countries aren't involved with trying to fill out like 27 different, you know, forms for, you know, that are slightly different for similar projects. I mean, so coordination is very important. I think this is something that we would like to expand our cooperation with China on. We're not alone. I think there are other donors who are interested in doing this. I think that it's important to recognize that China has a unique history and a unique vision for its role and how it does assistance. And you know, China has a great deal of pride in their the steps that they've been able to take to develop their own country and believe they have something to offer. Um, at the same time, I think you know it's fair to say that you know donor coordination is not something that has necessarily been one of their top concerns. We think the way to address it is to just address it to continue making clear to China that we are interested in expanding our cooperation. We're interested in working cooperatively. We are not seeking to compete in the provision of assistance. But rather, we think that both of our interests are served if we're better able to coordinate. Um, and, and not just both of ours, but bilaterally, but also with other donors and most with the countries that we're trying to assist. This is a long process. I mean, I've worked on China on and off for a, a fairly significant chunk of my career. And I think that what you see is that China's diplomatic engagement around the world has changed quite dramatically as China's own circumstances have changed. And we are able today to talk to China about issues that would have been unimaginable 15 years ago. So I am an optimist that we will be able to enhance our ability to work together in this. That we, because I think that China understands that this is something that's in its interest as well. And so this is going to be a process, and I believe that we will get to the right place. And I think that it's important because look, we have a very complex relationship with China. And I mean, there's no two ways about it. We are very, very proud of 
the steps that the United States has taken over a very long period of time. And, and regardless of you know, politics, I mean, if you look, there's been a tremendous amount of consistency regardless of which party has been in the White House uh, with its U.S.-China policy. We have sought to engage China and encourage China to play a greater part in the world, or a greater role in the world. We welcome this. Um, at the same time, you know, obviously, we, we believe China's role in the world needs to be one that supports global interests, including peace, stability, prosperity. Uh, and this is an appropriate subject of discussion. So I think that we're going to get there. I think that if you look at the last 30 years of change in China's global role, as well as the kinds of discussions that we've had and are able to have, that it, I'm, I'm confident that we, we have grounds for optimism that we're going to get there. So, you know, will the process be easy? No. And, you know, it, it, I think that if you look back, a lot of things that we do as a matter of course now were very hard to get off the ground. But I do think we'll, we'll get there. Questions? Yeah. Yes. My name is Raj. I'm a student of so public servant. My question is uh, basically, most of the Pacific Islanders, they, they have a view that U.S. has lost focus uh, towards the Pacific Island region. And uh, you know, it's more focused on its war against uh, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, sorry, uh, et cetera. Uh, would you be in a position to tell us, out of your total aid budget, what percentage is going towards the Pacific Island and the region? Unfortunately, I don't know off the top of my head, and I, I don't want to give, I don't want to make a number off and give something that's wrong. I mean, it's small percentage of our total aid budget. Um, I think that it is something that if, it's worth remembering that if you, that it's, it, given our unique relationships with compacts, it's not completely, it, it, it's not completely accurate to just look at the official development assistance because we do a tremendous amount of assistance in the region through a number of mechanisms that are linked to the compacts and therefore, but don't fall under our ODA accounts. Uh, I think that the important thing for us is that you know we recognize that you know first of all we've been engaged and continue to be engaged in the region um, for a long time. I mean, you know, one of the things is that the you know different elements of the U.S. government, particularly the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Coast Guard, have been very important players in the region um, throughout this period. I think that it's fair to say that we are trying to enhance our diplomatic engagement and at the same time expand the areas in which we cooperate. Um, in recognition, in part of the fact that it's in our interest to do it, but also the region is looking for us to do this. Uh, I think that the question of what is our focus is an appropriate one. I mean, at the same time, it is, I think, fair to say that we've devoted a pretty, you know, we've had seen an increase in the senior level engagement with the Pacific in the last three years. Um, which we think does address some of the concerns. I mean, what we hear, the messaging that we hear, and obviously, you know, we have to be a little cautious because, you know, people are polite and don't necessarily want to give us bad news to our face. But what we, we've gone from hearing, you're not doing enough, to can you sustain? Now, you know, do we need to do more? I think that we have to look for ways in which we can be effective as well and, and sustainable. But I also think that the, the fact that the question now is, okay, can you sustain it, is a sign that there is a recognition that we have stepped up our efforts. And that the real question is, is this something that's going to become a future of how we engage with the region? We believe that it should be, because we believe it's in our interest, and we believe that this is something that supports our broader Asia Pacific strategy. And so, you know, I, I'm confident that you will see that. And I think it's worth noting, this is something our, in our you know, Rebalancing towards the Asia Pacific is something that has fairly broad support across the political spectrum of the United States. You don't see a lot of people saying, oh, you shouldn't be focusing on the Asia Pacific region. And there's some legitimate questions about how this is best done. But I think that this is something where there is very clearly a recognition in the US that the extraordinary changes in the Asia Pacific region. And in that regard, I would note that you know, we really consider this to be a broader region, including South Asia that this is something that is going to have an extraordinary impact on the world that we live in. It's already doing that. I mean, you know, the, the, the changes in you know, global income and distribution and global patterns, global trade, that we've seen are just extraordinary. So I think that what we believe is that this engagement with the Pacific is part of that broader framework that's in the U.S. interest and we're committed to sustaining it. Yes. My name is Isa Abdelhadi. I'm the head of the regional delegation of Palestine to Australia, New Zealand and Pacific. Uh, two small questions. One is how would you describe now your relation with Fiji? 
Um, second question is very recently uh, we're, uh, very interested, I were very interested in working with the Pacific countries. There was a summit in 2009, the Pacific Airport uh, Summit, and they started providing some funds and services to the Pacific country. Also, Israel is trying to an interest, and you know, there are also of of funds now from Israel to the Pacific country. How do you describe and assist this kind of relationship? And do you have any kind of coordination meetings with two parties in the world and Israel in this context? That's an excellent question. I mean, the first part is our relationship with Fiji, obviously, is has been strained, as has the rest of the Pacific regions, as a result of what has happened there. Um, we are very supportive of the transition to democracy, the restoration of democracy. This includes the Constitutional Commission, which we provided support for. We believe that it is very, very important that this process goes on, as the government has committed to. And you know, we will be watching very closely to, to see if the government's deeds match its words in terms of how the constitutional commission process goes, then the subsequent steps of promulgating the constitution and you know, the movement towards elections. There have been some positive steps. I mean, I think that we, we are encouraged by them. We're at the same time cautious. We believe that what matters is that the deeds match the rhetoric. And so we, we th but if that happens, we believe that there is room for an improvement in the relationship, not just with the United States, but I think it's very clear that the region is committed to this as well. Um, that said, I think that you know this is a process that's going to be complicated. I mean, we're very realistic about the challenges that are involved, but we believe that it's important that the government of Fiji goes through and does with what it said it's going to do. Um, on the issue of the, uh, of the Arab world, Israel, as I said, we believe this is a region that can benefit from new partners and enhanced uh, partnerships. So you know, we believe that this is something that is positive, provided the assistance and the, the, that it becomes is something that serves the region. And I think that's really the critical question. Um, we do not have formal coordination mechanisms right now. That's certainly something that we should be doing. We believe that you know, the CANS Compact uh, framework is something that's potentially very valuable. We would encourage other countries that are seeking to play a role in the region to take part in that and to try and use that. Uh, and, and part of that is very simply put, if you want to be a player in the region, if you want to provide assistance, if you want to be a partner, it helps to know what others are doing to try and benefit from lessons learned so that can, things can be, assistance can be, uh, and support can be as effective as possible. So we think there's a strong interest in doing that. Uh, I think what we are cautious about is the idea of competition. I mean, you know, what we don't want to see is the kind of competition that historically has sometimes led to very bad outcomes. Um, where, you know, in, in that regard, you know, obviously the competition between China and Taiwan for recognition used to be a feature of the region. We believe that the fact that this is no longer as big an issue is extremely positive. And we welcome the steps that both China and Taiwan have taken to try and make sure that they, their assistance is much more focused on development outcomes rather than this kind of competition that used to be a feature of, what, of the, the political landscape. We believe that what matters is that whatever is done in the region supports the region, supports the goals and objectives of the countries involved, and the peoples, is respectful of the, of the different circumstances in different countries, and is something that really does advance the, the broader welfare of the countries involved, but also of the region. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, I'm Ingrid, a student here. Uh, thanks for your broad comments. I have a couple specific questions, I hope. Uh, You'll be able to answer about um, Micronesian communities in the United States. Um, I hope so too. I hope so. I know. Hopefully, I won't be too, <laughs> too specific for you. But um, I know with a lot of Micronesian communities, migrants towards the United States, where they have you know free access to the United States through the compact, um, but don't necessarily have the same access towards um, medical assistance, medical treatments, um, welfare, even though they are allowed. Um, food stamps. And I know in certain states there's been quite a pushback, such as Hawaii, Arkansas, Oklahoma, not wanting to pay for, um, in particular, I think of Marshallese patients, not wanting to, to take on that bill and putting pressure, asking, saying that it's the federal um, level. So I'm wondering if you know if this is at all on the U.S. federal government's sort of lines to think about covering um, Micronesians, because certainly there's going to be larger and larger amounts of, of migrants from Micronesia. Um, and then as a corollary question, um, I'm wondering if you can talk about um, if you have any information about the U.S.'s stance on the United Nations um, Human Rights Council.
Council looking further into the nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands and <coughs> seeking funding. Look, I mean, the first question, I mean, candidly, it is part something that we're starting to focus on. I mean, this is, to be honest, pretty far afield from the kinds of things the State Department traditionally worries about. Um, but obviously, to the extent that this starts to become an issue in our bilateral relationships, it's something that we do recognize as important. I, mean, I think that it's important to put this into context, and that, that is that you know, this is part of the broader challenge coming from non-communicable diseases, um, which is a challenge both in the countries involved as well as obviously you know, when, they, when people come to the United States. And the critical thing for us is that we need to work with the countries to take steps to address the challenges of non-communicable diseases. Um, this includes prevention, um, obviously, as well as to some degree improving enhancing treatment. I mean, you know, I think that there's a there's some de definitional issues about you know, are we talking about people who reside more or less permanently in the United States, who you know are there for an extended period of time, or people who come essentially just for the sake of you know, treatment. And so these are challenges. And look, it's a real issue. I mean, we were very sympathetic to the concerns of the people in the compact states. And at the same time, and, you know, I think it's important to note that the core issue is the fact that when people show up at an American hospital emergency room, they get treated. And you know, they, don't, they do not get turned away, even if it's you know, very expensive, complex treatments. They get that kind of treatment. That then obviously creates financial pressures for the hospitals involved. And so you know, this is something that we believe is a reflection of the, the, on one hand, the positives in terms of the values of you know, making sure that everyone becomes gets treatment uh, and who needs it. At the same time, you know, recognizing that there's a broader issue of the impact that has on other services that can be delivered to other people as well. This is a complex issue. There's no easy solution. non communicable diseases are a huge challenge in virtually every developed country. Um, you know, this is not something where there's a silver bullet. It's obviously going to require a really, really sustained and effective in, um, effort to try and address both prevention, treatment, uh, and you know, this is something that also creates some challenges in terms of how the federal government and state governments get along and handle financing. So this is not easy. I think that there is a recognition it's a problem. There's, we're going to keep working on it. I mean, ultimately, you know, this is something that the State Department's role is somewhat limited because you know, we care about it to the extent it's a bilateral issue, but the real solutions in many ways are something that's out of our purview. Um, on the marshals, I mean, we cooperated with the Special Rapporteur. Um, we, look, you know, the nuclear legacy in the marshals is very complicated. I mean, the U.S. has acknowledged our responsibility. We have sought to address the you know, needs of the people involved it, it, it as fully and as completely as possible. We've devoted hundreds of millions of dollars um, to try and address this. Um, you know, we recognize this continues to be a very complex and you know, sore point in the relationship with our peoples. Uh, so this is something where we've tried to be as transparent as possible. We recognize that there are continuing concerns about what happened. We're trying to address them. We don't. We believe that at this point, you know, we don't have. We don't have the ability to answer every single question or concern. There are always going to be people who are dissatisfied. We've tried very, very hard to be as transparent as possible. I mean, we do provide long-term, very sustained medical treatment to people who are directly involved and who are victims. We, you know, we, we, we've tried to address it through the tribunal. We've tried to address it through the compact. We've tried to do everything that we can on, with the marshals. We also recognize that it's understandable that people aren't completely satisfied. Um, this is going to be a challenge in the relationship for a long time to come. Uh, we think that the way to deal with it is by being as transparent as possible, being as straightforward as possible. I think that from an American perspective, we do believe that we have done the things that we have been asked to do, that we've tried to address the concerns, and that we will keep trying to do everything we can within the constraints that we have of the, the fact that we're never going to be able to do everything that everybody wants. Yes. Um, I'm going to my own. Uh, you mentioned some priorities for uh, U.S. foreign policy and for federal systems delivery in the Pacific. Why don't you mention this climate change? Can you give us a little bit of detail about what the U.S. is doing to ameliorate the effects of climate change in the Pacific region? Yeah, that's one of the things that was announced in Rotonga was, um, a, I think, $25 million dollars um, to address some, to help mitigate some of the impacts. We recognize this is, you know, small 
a, a very small amount in comparison to the overall need. But we recognize that you know, you've got to start somewhere. And that what we want to try and do is help address some of the challenges and help mitigate some of it and also work on adaptation. Um, I think that the specific details of this, frankly, I, you know, they're, they're in the hands of our uh, um, the USAID mission in Port Moresby, and I'm not that familiar with it, so I'm you know, very reluctant to make a you know, bigger fool of myself than I already have by trying to address it. But I'd say that you know, it is a recognition of the fact this is a critical thing for the region, and we totally understand that. Uh, we understand this is something where, you know, on a certain level, we're never going to be able to fully address the concerns. We're never going to be able to solve all the problems. But again, we think it's important to start, and that this is part of reinforcing our commitment to working with the region and to really being a partner to the region. Yes. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I actually had a question. I was very interested in your focus on the rebalance towards the Asia Pacific and the emphasis on the Asia Pacific following from that. I know also that you highlighted a number of continuities in US engagement in the Asia Pacific more broadly and in the Pacific, such as working with allies, coordinating with emerging partners, um, in, in strengthening institutions. I guess what I'm interested in is how do you see US engagement in the Pacific as distinguished from other areas in the region, such as Southeast Asia? In that context, what are US priorities for engagement in the Pacific and in the context of the challenges that exist? I think the you know there's a couple of things. I think the first is that you know we see this, we see a great deal of continuity because this is part of our strategy of engaging with you know enhancing our engagement across the board um, with the region, also engaging with key regional institutions in the case of Southeast Asia, ASEAN, in the case of the Pacific, the Pacific Islands Forum. Uh, and of looking for ways in which we can step up our engagement um, by, you know, through dialogues, through enhanced discussion, and to try and address some of the concerns. I mean, you know, there, there's the reality that the, there are ma major challenges, there are significant differences, not just between different parts of the Asia Pacific region, but within those regions and, you know, country by country. I think that our priority is, first of all, to be a good partner to be a good partner to countries in the region, as well as to our traditional friends and partners, um, in, such as Australia and New Zealand. Um, we, and then there, you know, there are other countries as well. I, mean, I should know Japan and the EU and France are all very important um, players in the region. And you know, these are countries which were obviously, there in the case of the EU institutions, with which we have long-standing partnerships and we work very closely together. And so that's something where we think we bring a little bit to the table. We also are, you know, major, we have major roles in the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank and in other, the IMF, other you know, multilateral development banks. So that's something where we think that we can bring something to the table. I think our priority is to enhance what we're doing, to be an effective partner, to try and support the aspirations and the goals of the countries in the region, including obviously development, but also regional integration, enhanced trade, um, you know, to, uh, the development of capital, and to look for ways in which we can do that, recognizing that our means are limited. Um, you know, we we are trying to increase them, but there's still you know a small fraction of the overall aid flows into the region. Yes. Um, following the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1990, the whole of the Russian Far East sort of went into serious decline. It appears from uh, the last experience of the last year or two that uh, Russia has uh, changed its attitude towards the development of the Far East and to put a lot more resources and effort into it, both economically and from a rural point of view. This uh, raises the question of the relationship with Russia with the Asia Pacific and indeed of course with the United States and President Obama has talked about resetting the relationship that doesn't seem to have had much response from the Russian side. So it seems to be good and bad signals coming out of the relationship there. I wondered if you'd like to comment on this because sure. 20 years ago if we talked about it, it would have been the very first question, not probably the last question. That's right. Uh, look, I mean, first of all, I think you know, I challenge one thing, which is that the relationship with Russia, we think, has made some significant strides. Uh, you know, the, the, and, and I think it's also worth noting that you know, it, it, it's a complex relationship. There are a lot of different issues. We were able to work together effectively on quite a few. And one of the points I think, where I think we've had some real progress in improvement has been on Iran. 
um, the unity of the Security Council and the, um, the, uh, the P5 plus 1 process has been very, very important and has put extraordinary, uh, you know, it's done, it seen extraordinary improvement and increase in the economic impact of sanctions on Iran, which we think has been very positive. So, you know, I would challenge the assertion that the relationship hasn't improved. I mean, there are many other areas we work together. One of them is we've managed to expand our ability to talk about the Asia Pacific region. We welcome Russia playing a greater role in the region. And obviously, Russia is a part of the region. I mean, the Russian Far East is very important on a number of for a number of reasons. One of which is as a conduit for very significant flows of energy. Uh, we believe this is very, very good for the region, and we believe Russia playing a greater role in the region is something that can be quite positive. Uh, you know, so I think it's important to recognize that we see this as a positive development. We see this also as a return to you know normalcy in some degree. I mean, Russia has historically, going back to you know the, like the 1780s, 1790s, been a feature in the area, and this is something that we think it, you know is not something that threatens U.S. interests. Rather, that it can support and enhance the broader engagement in the region. In that regard, I should note that the U.S. and Russia both joined the East Asia Summit at the same time. Um, that we view the Russians as very valuable partners in APEC as well as EAS. Uh, th these are things where we think we can work together to s promote both of our interests in a peaceful and prosperous and uh, growing and effective uh, Asia Pacific region. So I think that's uh, that's something where, that we see as a positive. And what we what we see is you know across the line, it's important to know when the U.S. you know talks about rebalancing, we talk about greater emphasis on the Asia Pacific region. I, mean, I think that it's worth noting, we're not unique in this. I mean, virtually every country in the world um, is seeking to expand and enhance its relationships with the Asia Pacific. And that's not because of some, you know, it's not, not because of some sort of foreign policy theology or anything. It's because there are very, very sound economic as well as diplomatic and political reasons for doing this. And so we think this is good. I mean, we recognize that across the board, countries want to improve their relationship with China. We think it's important that they look beyond China, though. And I think this is where, to some degree, you know, we make, I don't want to say we have any disagreements, but we think it's important for countries to look strategically and recognize that the rise of the Asia Pacific is not just a China story. Uh, and I think that sometimes gets missed, perhaps. And we obviously are very, very appreciative of the extraordinary development that's taking place in China and China's growing role. We welcome this. I mean, this is a framework, again, that in many ways has been helped to be set by you know, long, sustained U.S. engagement uh, and a very steady U.S. policy. But I think that the Asia-Pacific story is one that encompasses the extraordinary growth in ASEAN, the you know, continued importance of, of uh, Japan and the growth in Korea. Uh, as well as the, the, the fact that India's growth, and uh, historically India has been a part of Asia. Um, and you know, in, in many ways, Southeast Asia is where you know, the, the India, the sort of Indian influence and Chinese influence kind of met and overlapped. This, I mean, we recognize India is going to be more of a part of the region, and we welcome that. We have worked very hard to try and ensure that we're talking to India, sharing perspectives, and making clear that we think this is a positive for the region, a positive for the United States. So this is something, and at the same time, European countries, you know, there's been some concern. I think one of the things that you see, we sometimes pick up from Asia and say, well, you know, gee, this is great, but aren't your traditional European friends annoyed by this? Well, our, our response is, you know, countries around the world, including in Europe, are all trying to do the same thing. You know, everyone recognizes that there is a very strong interest in enhancing engagement and relationships in the Asia Pacific. And this is something that you know, we've talked to the Europeans about for many years. We have very good dialogues with them across a range of issues. Uh, and we think that this is something where, again, we, there's no conflict between our interests. This is rather something where we help reinforce each other and support each other. And we think that it's good for the region as well. We've got time for a few more questions. Yes. You spoke of meaningful, oh, sorry, George, a student here, okay. You spoke of meaningful um, engagement in the Pacific. When do you see that uh, the United States will be able to bilateral engagement? Your rhetoric is very, of the region of um, You just said how, how and when, and what are the challenges stopping U.S. bilateral engagement? Well, I, I, first of all, I don't think that we're, I, I will challenge the basic premise. We are engaged bilaterally. Uh, you know, obviously it's a little bit different because we do, we're not represented in every um, Pacific country. 
in, we have embassies in the compact states. We also have regional embassies that cover um, you know, Melanesia, and we have then an embassy in, um, in Suba that covers five countries. They are very active. And you know, I think it's worth noting that we are very, we're working closely with the government of PNG. Um, we have expanded our presence and our relationships um, with, uh, in the Solomons and Vanuatu. You know, we have a, an embassy in, um, in Samoa. Uh, you know, we, we, we do try and stay in I mean, We're talking bilateral and a range of different issues. I think that one of the things that's worth noting is that this isn't just about assistance. I mean, you know, one of the things that we believe is very important is that you know, our engagements with the region are not just about, here's, you know, what have we done for you lately? You know, that this is because we, the relationships are more complex and we think go much beyond assistance. Obviously, assistance is important. But, you know, I think that it is belittling to the region to suggest that the only thing that matters is, you know, how much assistance you give and, you know, how it's done. And we think that there are some strategic issues that we talk about. We have broad cooperation in, on a lot of things around the world. Um, you know, we, we recognize that there, you know, countries are dealing with their own challenges, but we, at the same time, we think that it's very important that we discuss our range of issues, ranging from security issues, you know, countries, that there are countries that are becoming more active in a variety of international fora, um, and as well as some cooperation with the UN, um, and bilateral cooperation on a variety of issues dealing with like transnational organized crime, you know, illegal um, unlicensed and unreg unregulated fishing, and things like that. So I mean, we do have bilateral dialogues. We think they're important. Obviously, we like to enhance them and expand them. Um, it is a challenge doing that where we're not present in every country. I mean, by and large, you know, we do try and make sure that our embassies are active. And I think that you know, we, there's a great deal of travel by our ambassadors and other embassy staff to make sure that we're engaging with countries. It's a challenge. We don't, let's not kill ourselves. As you know, distances are big. You know, flights are few. It's very expensive to do. But we think it's important that it's worth it when we're trying to do that. We continue to study what we can do to try and make what we do with the region more effective, both regionally but also bilaterally. So this is something that I think, you know, we clearly we have to keep working at this. And we can and hopefully we'll do better. Um, but at the same time, we're very proud of the engagement that we've had, the kind of cooperation that we have um, with, you know, PNG, with Tonga, with uh, Samoa. You know, I mean, so th these are things that we do like, fairly effectively and that are part and parcel of our engagement with the region. Now, we're just about out of time. I wonder if I could just finish with a question of my own. And that is, um, we're going to know in a couple of weeks' time whether the same administration stays or a new administration comes in. In your view, is this pivot to the Asia Pacific, in its specific islands aspect, is this a sort of embedded shift in, a, in American foreign policy that would survive a change of administration or something that belongs pretty much to the president? I think that you know, it is very unwise for uh, career uh, officials <laughs> <laughs> to speculate too much about what happens if one is an election. Um, and, you know, I think that you know, very clearly, we're very proud of the fact, we think that there is a long-standing bipartisan strain in the U.S. policy towards the Asian Pacific. I think China is, of course, the best example. But if you look at this, I mean, administrations, regardless of political party, have supported our long-standing security engagements in the region. The you know, administrations from uh, both parties have been involved in expanding trade in the region. So this is something that we think, you know, there, there's clear evidence that there is a sustained bipartisan view of the region. The exact way in which this plays out, obviously, very hard to make any you know, concrete statements on, other than the fact I would note that you, know, you don't see a lot of criticism of the idea that we need to be more engaged and more focused in the broader Asia Pacific region or of the engagement with the Pacific. Um, you know, I think how exactly that plays out, how much of it is, you know, how you know, does it change? And, and I think it's worth noting that you know, almost certainly, regardless of the results, there will be some changes in personnel. Um, but I think that you know how that plays out is something that's very hard to speculate on now. We believe that there's a very strong strategic case to be made for why the U.S. needs to be engaged in, in the region, why we need to continue to enhance what we do, and why the region matters to the United States. And as a result, we believe that there is you know some reason to be confident that this is going to be sustained. But at the same time, I would not want to mislead anyone and, and or speculate and say anything definite because. Honestly, I don't think it's possible to know. Thank you very much. So it just leaves me to thank Edgar Kagan.
for a very broad analysis of the region from Pacific Islands, bringing in some, some questions that deal with uh, his expertise in Northeast Asia and other uh, places as well. And we're grateful to him for coming around to uh, the ANU this evening to deliver this address. Thanks very much.